Growing up in North Carolina, not, not too far from the coast, I've always had an interest in pirate history. Over the last, I mean, for, for vacation over the last few years, um, I've been taking my family uh, down to a place called Topsail Island in North Carolina, and there's all kinds of fascinating pirate history in that area, especially related to the pirate named Edward Teach, who was also known as Blackbeard, and Blackbeard's ship was called Queen Anne's Revenge. And it sunk off the coast of North Carolina, and to this day, his treasure has never been found. And so I can nerd out about this, okay? I can talk a lot more about it, but here's, I'll, I'll I'll just say this. Of all that I've seen in this pirate history, by far, the best name for a pirate ship that I've, I've come across is a ship that was named the Fancy. The Fancy was the name of a ship led by the pirate Henry Avery back in the year 1695. Henry Avery started as a member of the British Navy, and after he served in the Navy, he became a merchant sailor, and eventually he was promoted to be the first mate of a Spanish trading ship. But then he he ended up convincing the entire crew of this ship to commit mutiny, take over the ship and become pirates. And so they changed the name of this ship, thing was called like Charles II, they changed the name of this ship to the Fancy. And by July of 1695, uh, Henry Avery was attempting the greatest pirate heist in history. It's a true story. This is, this is how the story goes, all right? He, apparently, he learned, Avery had learned that there was a huge convoy of Indian ships that was sailing from India uh, toward Mecca on the Arabian Sea, and this was a fleet of about 25 ships in total. They were all owned by the emperor of India, and the most prized ship was carrying what would have amounted to today about $300 million of treasure. And so Avery decided that he would capture it. He was going to go for it. The only problem was he was insanely outnumbered by this convoy of ships. And so basically what Avery does is he recruits other pirates to help him. He, he, he builds together a coalition of pirates and they form what would have been something like a pirate armada. And they pursued this convoy over several months. And by, the, by September of 1695, they had uh, basically destroyed or hijacked the entire fleet. They stole all the treasure and Avery escaped and was never seen again. True story. He became, Henry Avery became a nightmarish legend within his own century. He and his crew were notorious for being cruel and vicious. They had a reputation for torturing their prisoners. Avery himself was reported to have done barbaric things. He and his crew were known, they were known for these things. But do you know one fact about them that they were not known for? Their unity. They they were united pirates. They they started by uniting together to commit mutiny. For, For months, they united together for months, united together to pursue this Indian convoy. Somehow, Henry Avery convinced these other pirates to unite together with his crew for the attack. There was a lot of pirate unity going on. And so why then, why are they not known for their unity? It's because they were pirates. They would have been basically the terrorist of, of the 17th century. And, and the fact is nobody, nobody admires 
the unity of terrorists. So one thing I just want to get clear this morning as we start here in this passage in Philippians, and as over the next two weeks we're going to be looking at the topic of unity, I want to just clarify right away that unity in and of itself is worthless. It's actually it's probably overrated. Unity for the sake of unity. Like everybody just agreeing together and everybody being on the same page, it doesn't count for anything. In fact, it could be terrible. In fact, it could be destructive. The question that we always have to be asking is, what is the unity for? What matters is not agreeing together. It's what you're agreeing together about. Being on the same page together is only good if what's on that page is good, right? This makes sense to us. We understand this, but it's important for us to nail this down right at the start because in our day, I think the idea of, of unity or being, being united, united, unity, all that, it's a little bit of a cultural buzzword. You see it a lot. And if we're just listening to the world around us, we can make the mistake of thinking that unity itself is a virtue. But it's not. Unity itself is not a virtue, not even within churches. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, he's concerned about a certain kind of unity. And, and we're going to see that next week in chapter 2 for sure. But here at the end of chapter 1 is where we see why this unity is so important for the local church. In today's passage, the Apostle Paul gives us at least three defining marks of what real church unity is. And this is relevant for us because if our church, if we are going to experience real biblical unity, is going to be marked by these three things. And so I'm eager to show this to you, but first let's pray again and ask for God's help. Father in heaven, in this moment, we thank you. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures and we thank you for your Holy Spirit who speaks and works through your Scriptures according to your will. Father, we ask that now by your grace, accomplish in us what magnifies your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So three marks, three marks of real church unity. The first is this, real church unity is Holy Spirit unity. Look at the end of verse 27. Now we focused on verse, uh, the first part of verse 27 last week. We were kind of looking at the second part of it this week, but Paul says, verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. We can just stop right there for a minute. I want everybody, if you can, look at those three words there, in one spirit. In verse 27, those three words, in one spirit. If you see it, say, got it. In one spirit. Now, that's another way to talk about unity. And the spirit here in verse 27, I think it's talking about, I think Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit. So if you're reading from the NIV translation, there's a, usually a, there's a capital S in spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. I think that's right. Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit here. In other places, when Paul uses this phrase, in one spirit, it's pretty clear that he has the Holy Spirit in mind. For example, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, obviously. And Paul is making a case there for unity in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.18, 
In Ephesians 2, Paul's been explaining how Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And Paul says, for through him, through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Again, pretty clear, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying here that whatever our differences are as Christians, we have unity in the Holy Spirit. See, Paul couldn't care less about generic, why can't we all just get along unity? Paul's concern is that local churches are united in the Holy Spirit. And this unity in the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit unity is supernatural, divinely created unity. And it's a foundational mark of real church unity. The foundational mark of real church unity is Holy Spirit unity. And this Holy Spirit unity is doing something. All right, this is the second thing to see here. The second mark of real church unity is that real church unity shows our common treasure. It shows our common treasure. And this is, again, the second mark is still kind of at a high level. I just want you to see here in the passage, I want you to see the connection between your manner of life being worthy of the gospel and then you're standing firm in one spirit. So if you, if, you're, if you like to draw lines and circles in your Bible, this is what you can do. You can underline or you can bracket the phrase there, the sentence, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. You can bracket that. And then you can look down, you could circle standing firm in one spirit. And then you can just draw a little line that connects the two because they're connected. Paul is saying that if this church is living worthy of the gospel, it will be displayed through their Holy Spirit unity. He's saying that if A is true, then B is going to be evident. You're going to see it. Holy Spirit unity within the local church is a manifestation of that church living worthy of the gospel. And again, like we saw last week, if we, if we zoom in more on what it means to live worthy of the gospel, it does not mean that we deserve the gospel, but it means that our lives together fit with the gospel. The way we live lines up with who Jesus is. And so we saw last week that for our church to be worthy of the gospel, it means that our church's life together in this world witnesses to the all-satisfying value of Jesus. Paul knows, he knows that one way this all-satisfying value in Jesus is seen is through suffering. And he explains that. We saw that last week in 29 and 30. That's one way that our treasure is evident is through our suffering. But another way that it's seen is through this unity that Paul's talking about here. If this church is treasuring Jesus above everything else, they're going to have Holy Spirit unity. They're going to have real church unity, which is not unity for its own sake. It's unity that's pointing to something else. It's unity that shows our common treasure. And Paul, Paul knows he's either going to see that for himself or he's going to hear about it. He's going to come to him and see it or he's going to hear it in a report. And so here's, here's a big question that we need to ask. What exactly does it look like? Like, what does this real church unity look like? What, ex- what exactly is Paul wanting to come and see or to hear about in verse 27? He has something in mind that he wants to see and that he wants to hear about. So we should ask, what is that? This is where what we see in the passage is Paul, he actually lays it out for us. He gives us more details about what characterizes real church, Holy Spirit unity. And so what I want us to do here for this third mark is just zoom in, focus on what this is. All right. So this is Let's say it like this to start. Here's the third mark. The third mark of real church unity is that real church unity 
is ready for battle. Ready for battle. We're still in verse 27. Verse 27 is a long verse, all right? We're still in verse 27. In the second half of verse 27, Paul describes how he hopes to find this church or what he wants to hear about this church. And he tells us, he gives us three things in a metaphor, all right? Now we've seen the first. The first is that Paul hopes to find this church standing firm in one spirit. Standing firm, that's a metaphor. He wants to find the church standing firm in one spirit. Second, Paul says, he wants to find this church with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Then the third thing he says, he wants to find this church not being frightened in anything by your opponents. And you'll notice if you look at those three things together, that each of those three descriptions are all within the same metaphor. And the metaphor is a battle metaphor. It's a battle metaphor. And a battle metaphor makes sense in light of the context. Just remember what's going on here. Paul, he, he is writing this letter from where? He's in prison writing this letter. He's, he's, not, he's in prison in Rome. And he's writing this letter to um, a church in the Roman colony of Philippi. And so this whole thing is surrounded by opposition. It's just just the whole context here. There's there's opposition and Paul talks about it. The the reason that Paul, he he explains here in verse 30, we saw last week, he, he makes mention of their shared suffering. In verse 30, he says that these these Philippian Christians are engaged in the same conflict that he's had. And most likely when he talks about this same conflict, he's referring to the same opponents. And and those opponents are most likely the Romans. There's some type of Roman pressure that these Christians are facing. Paul mentions the opponents like in verse 28 by name. He says the opponents. But although he mentions them in verse 28, we should remember they've been there the whole time. They've been around the whole time. They're in the air the whole time, and the church at Philippi knows it. And that's the reason why he's using this battle metaphor. It's an important metaphor. It fits with what's going on. And what this does for us is it tells us right away, when it comes to church unity, it tells us right away that church unity is not idealistic. All right? Church unity is not some kind of rosy, posh, pristine, neat unity. It's embattled unity. It's unity that is under siege. It's unity that's not just for when things are going their best, but it's unity that matters when things are at their worst. This is real church unity is unity that is ready for battle. And that means three things here I want you to see. These are three things that Paul tells us. Real church unity ready for battle means first, we hold our ground. We hold our ground. That's what that idea of standing firm means in verse 27. Standing firm is is really the main verb here in the second part of this sentence in verse 27. You could say that the main thing here that Paul wants us, the, the main thing that Paul wants to himself see, the main thing that he wants to hear about with this church is that they're standing firm, that they they are uh, practicing this kind of defensive image that they're, they're digging in their heels or maintaining. He wants to know that this church is standing, holding their ground. And if you're holding your ground, church, it means that we're going to avoid two things. It means that we neither change our message nor retreat our witness. We neither change our message nor retreat our witness. These are two mistakes that have been made throughout church history, and we can see examples of this even within America over the last 250 years. First, consider consider theological liberalism. This is going back to the early 1800s. Liberal theology 
really started to be a thing. And a big driver behind liberal theology was the fear that Christianity would become irrelevant to modern minds. I think there were some good intentions. They were afraid that the gospel, Christianity, the Bible would become irrelevant. And so in an attempt to make Christianity appealing to more people, they tried to make the Bible fit with all the modern theories of science and enlightenment philosophy. And so that meant that they watered down biblical authority, they, uh, they played cut and paste with certain parts of scripture, and eventually what they ended up with is an entirely different religion. Theological liberalism basically has invented a God without wrath who brought a people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. They changed the message, see? But we have to remember that Christianity is fundamentally a message. Christianity is good news. It's news about who Jesus is and what he's done. And so when you change the message, you actually don't have Christianity anymore. You have something different. You have a different religion. So don't do that. We don't, we're not going to do that. But then there's another mistake that we can make, and that's the mistake of retreating our witness. In this mistake, Christians might still hold on to the truths of Christian doctrine, but they withdraw from society and they sort of barricade themselves in isolated communities. And immediately you might be thinking of something like Amish communities in America. That is one example, but this is actually much broader than that. This, this retreat way of thinking can actually be in any church and in any community, and maybe most commonly it's in how we can think as individuals. Any time that we as individuals hide our light under a basket, any time that we take on a kind of flea mentality, a kind of get away mentality, that's retreating our witness. It's a mistake. Retreating our witness is a mistake, so don't do that. We hold our ground. Real church unity means we hold our ground. We neither change our message nor retreat our witness. Number two, second here, Real church unity means, this, this, this battle metaphor means that we fight for gospel advance. This is important here. I need to, we need to clarify this. We see it here at the end of verse 27. Paul's explaining more of what it means to stand firm in the Holy Spirit. He says, we are with one mind, so unity is there. With one mind, we're striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So this is active unity. It's not bunker down, get away, hide somewhere, unity. This is active unity. It's engaging unity. And it's striving side by side. The word there for striving side by side, it, it literally means like fighting with. You're fighting together. We're, we're fighting together. We're striving together on the same team. And we're going to see this word again. It's only used twice in the whole New Testament, both times in Philippians. We're going to see the word again in chapter 4. And uh, I'll, I'll say some comments for when we get there because it's fascinating what's going on in chapter 4. But for today, mainly, this is what I want you to see. I want you to see that this, this side-by-side fighting is for a common goal more than it's against the common enemy. It's for a common goal more than it's for against the common enemy. Now, it's important I think that, that Paul, he doesn't define side-by-side -side fighting by its opposition. Because the opposition is going to take different forms over the next 2,000 years. It's going to change. Instead, the apostle Paul, he defines this side-by-side -side fighting by what it's fighting for. He defines it by its common goal, and he calls it the faith of the gospel. 
We're contending for that. We're fighting for that. And that phrase there, the faith of the gospel, is unique. There's a, there's a lot of unique phrases and words in Philippians. This is one of them. This is the only time Paul uses this exact phrase. And there's some questions then. What, what does he mean by it? It's the only time he uses it. What does he mean here? I think in context, we can see that the faith of the gospel is a more comprehensive idea than just saying the gospel. It, it's more. The faith of the gospel is not only talking about the gospel message itself, but it also includes all the truths and implications of the gospel. One commentator, he explains that Paul here is stressing both the communication of and the conduct of the gospel. Another way to put it is that when Paul uses this phrase, he's, he's wanting maximum gospel advance. Maximum gospel advance. He doesn't just want people to hear the gospel. He wants everyone to be mature in Christ. This is Colossians 1.28. He wants to present everyone mature in Jesus. He wants as many people as possible to hear the gospel and believe the gospel and then become like Jesus from the heart. The way that we've talked about that at our church is that we, our, our goal in gospel advance is in both distance and depth. We want the gospel message to advance geographically. We want people who've never heard the gospel to hear the gospel. We want our neighbors to hear the gospel. We want the good news of Jesus to spread everywhere. And so we give and we go and we labor for that. And also, at the same time, we want the gospel of Jesus to have its fullest effect on us. We want the gospel to advance to all peoples and in all of us, in all of our lives. And that's something that we fight for. It's something that we fight for together. We fight for it for one another. That's what discipleship is. It means that we as a local church, we are committed to helping one another follow Jesus. And that's not easy. Sounds good. It's not easy. It means that we're going to have to wrestle through some stuff together. It, it, it may mean that there's going to be some times when we may not agree on every single detail. There may even be times when we have to say or hear uncomfortable words. But the goal is gospel advance. What we want is more of Jesus out there and more of Jesus in here. And so we fight for that. We fight for that. What I want for you and what you want for me, what we want for one another is that Jesus be our all-consuming passion and our all-satisfying treasure. And that does not just happen. It doesn't just happen. We labor for it. We strive together side by side. We gotta fight for it. We gotta fight for it. Real church unity means that we're fighting for this together, for this gospel advance. The third detail, when it comes to this battle metaphor, it means we are courageous when it costs. Courageous when it costs. Verse 27, let's check where we are. Verse 27, Paul says he, he hopes his church is holding its ground. He wants his church fighting side by side for gospel advance. In verse 28, in verse 28 now, he says here, he doesn't want them to be frightened, not frightened in anything by your opponents. And a positive way to say not be frightened is to say be courageous. It means that we're not hindered by those who would stand against us with their threats. It means we press on in our witness. It means we keep going. It means we're not surprised by opposition and we're not stopped by it. And all of this, if we are just, if we're honest about it, it's all easier said than done until we start thinking about the cost. Courage is only courage 
if it comes with the threat of cost, just to be clear. That's what makes it courage. There's a cost involved, the threat of a cost involved. And so when you think about us, when you think about our context, what do you think that is? For us, what is the the threat of cost that we face? When we're determined to hold our ground on what the Bible says, when we are wrestling together for gospel advance in this world and in our lives, what is at stake for us? For Paul, it literally was his life. I think for the church at Philippi, it could have been, it could have been their lives too. So what about when it comes to our opposition, when it comes to opponents we might face? What cost is threatened against us? <clears throat> well, it's different, right? This, the, the cost is different for different churches in different parts of the world. But for us, I think the threat of cost is our comfort. It's our comfort. Those who oppose us threaten to make things difficult for us. It, it means most basically that people will think badly of you. Your neighbors will think you're stupid. Your coworkers will call you a bigot. And if we're honest, like, man, that's just, that really, that's hard for some of us. It's hard for us. The fact that we could be ridiculed, the fact that we could be mocked, the fact that we could be unfairly criticized, it bothers us. But the truth is, and this is just a reality check, (laughs) Being a Christian in a 21st century progressive metro like ours is going against the grain. And going against the grain will not be smooth. It won't be easy. And it won't be comfortable. It requires courage. And the courage we need is the same courage that Paul had. It's the same courage that he wants to see in the church at Philippi. It's it's courage that has considered its gain far better than every good thing it could lose on earth, including life itself. See, this is where, for Paul, his thinking in verses 20 and 21 is still showing up. Remember, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So whatever the opponents might take from us, Jesus is better and we choose him. That's what we say. Whatever the cost might be, Jesus is better and we choose Jesus. The church together is choosing Jesus over and over and over again, no matter what the cost may be. That is real church unity. And so yes, verse 28 tells us, that's a clear sign to your opponents about how all this is gonna go down. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. The gospel is advancing and the gospel will keep advancing until one day every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. Like, guys, we we have the end of the story. So we can have courage now, right? We know how it's going to go. We can have courage now and real church unity has this kind of courage. Real church unity is ready for battle. We hold our ground. We fight for gospel advance. And we're we're courageous even when it costs. Paul wants that for the church at Philippi. 
And the apostle wants that for our church today. And that's what brings us now to this table. We come to this table, this communion table, this uniting ordinance. And this is where we just need to remember that you, you don't actually get unity by aiming for unity. See, that's the secret here. You don't get unity by aiming for unity. Unity is just what happens when you want the same thing. And for us, we want our treasure. His name is Jesus. We want him. And this is where we remember that at this table. At this table is where this is really what happens here. Everything else for a moment is pushed aside. And we remember Jesus Christ. We remember his death for us. And we remember that Jesus alone is our hope. We want him. We, we want him. And so we come to this table and we enjoy him. We adore him. We treasure him. And I want to invite you to do that this morning. If you're here and you're a Christian, if you're here and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, we invite you now to eat and to drink with us. We're going to serve the bread first. Just hold the bread. I'll come back up and we'll eat it all together. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.